morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Khaled El Sheikh. Uh, for those of you that want to try and pronounce my name, it's Khaled El Sheikh in Arabic. Um, most of you probably shouldn't try. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so, a little bit about myself first. Um, I've been in the oil field industry for 21 years. Um, I spent 16 years with Schlumberger uh, in various locations around the world. Um, currently, I've been with Al Khoraif Petroleum for five years uh, as uh, the vice president of the artificial lift business. So, um, we are a, just for people that don't know who APC is, Al Khoraif Petroleum, we're a we're an um, oil field services provider out of Saudi. We're a family-owned business. Um, we provide different services to end-user customers, a la Aramco, you know, ExxonMobil, these types of companies um, that we work with. Um, we're in 11 countries around the world across three different continents. And one of the main businesses we have is um, electrical submersible pumps. Okay? And that's part of the artificial lift division that I currently um, am running. So today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we're doing in edge computing um, for digitalizing our ESP offering. So first of all, I want to tell you what an ESP is. I'm assuming most of you don't know what an electrical submersible pump is, so I'm going to tell you what one is first, and then we can get into what we're doing. Okay, so what an ESP is, I want you to imagine an oil well, um, and you need to try to produce oil from this well. About 90% of the wells around the world do not produce naturally. Okay. There are countries around the world, particularly in the Middle East, where they're very fortunate. When they, when they drill a well, there's enough pressure for the oil to produce by itself. But most countries around the world, that doesn't really happen. And over time, even if it does happen, um, the reservoirs deplete very fast, and you will need some form of lift to get the fluid out the ground. There are multiple ways of doing this. You can use a rod pump, which I'm sure in the US you've seen them, the ones that go up and down. You see them in Texas a lot. Um, you have electrical submersible pumps, which I'm going to describe to you now, and there's gas lift as well as another type, and plunger lift, there's many different types. So we're in the ESP business, or the electrical submersible pumping business, and the way this works is we put um, a centrifugal pump driven by um, an AC electric motor in the well, and we deploy it to the depth that we need it, so it could be anywhere from a few thousand feet to as much as 12,000 feet under the ground, and we connect a very long piece of electric cable to it, and we basically turn it on, and it starts to produce. OK, so this is kind of what it looks like. We typically have a sensor on the bottom of the equipment, that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We then have the electric motor. So this is how we put it together in the field, actually. If you imagine on a rig, this is exactly what people will do. They'll put a sensor, they'll put another piece on top, another piece on top. We have to stack this equipment up. Just so you get an idea of the scale, the length of the motor is typically about 30 foot long. The length of the entire string, when we put the whole thing together, is anywhere from 100 to 200 foot in length. Right? So it's quite a long piece of equipment. The reason it's so long is oil wells are quite diameter-wise, they're quite small because they're very expensive to drill. Um, so you're dealing with quite small diameters. These things are typically, the smallest are about three and a half inches in diameter. The biggest can get up to sort of seven and a half inch in diameter. But typically what we, no we normally lose is four and a half to five and a half inch diameter equipment. So it's not very big. So to get the power you need, you need the length. So we have the motor, and that can be one or two motors, or even three, depending on how much horsepower. Typically, horsepower-wise, we're looking at anywhere from you know, 100 horsepower up to 1,500 horsepower that we're trying to put inside the wells, depending on how much oil you want to produce. OK, so that's what the motor looks like. We have a, what we call a protector. Um, I won't go into the technical details of this, but the protector is very important because it protects, it basically does what it says. It protects the motor, so make sure no external fluid can get into the motor because the motor's got oil inside it and you don't want um, any of your oil well fluid, which is full of water, to get inside your motor because you'll burn your motor. Um, it also makes sure we have pressure, um, we equalize the pressure of the motor on the inside because imagine you're 10,000 foot under the ground, you have very high pressures. Um, and also, it takes the thrust from the pump that's going to be above. I'll show you in a minute. Um, here's the, the cable that we connect to the motor to give it power. Okay? Um, there's an intake where the fluid will go in. And then we stick the pumps on top. Okay? And typically, we can have anywhere from two to five pumps that we connect. Okay? 
Um, then we put a head on the top and we put the tubing on the top and that tubing goes all the way up to the surface and it pumps the fluid all the way to surface, okay? Um, so this is kind of, and now all this stuff is connected with shafts inside, with couplings inside so that the motor power, the torque from the motor transfers all the way up to the pump and spins that pump and allows the fluid to come in and start producing pressure, okay? And that's basically what it looks like. Now, you can imagine these things, we do no maintenance on them. I mean, we, we put them together, we put them in the ground, and they have to run three to four years. We will never see them until they fail. We will never get an opportunity to do any maintenance whatsoever on this equipment. If it fails, the workover cost to be able to take it out the ground and replace it again can be in the multi-million dollars for our customers, right? I mean, a rig, especially if it's offshore, if you're offshore, a rig can cost you anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a day, and it can take ten days to replace this thing. So it's do the maths; it gets very expensive. So if you have a failure that fails after six months, your customers are not going to be very happy. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is the amount of time it takes to get rigs um, onto a well. In the US, you're lucky. You have lots of rigs on land, for example. In Texas, it's easy. If a well fails, usually it's a couple of days and you can replace it. Try doing that in somewhere like Saudi. It can be, it can be a month, it can be two months, it can be longer. It's much more, it's much, especially offshore. Um, so you're not producing oil for that period of time. So that's what we call deferred oil. And that's lost oil for that period of time, do the maths on that, and it gets very, very high. I mean, $100 a barrel that we're at today, or whatever it is today, I think it's about 80. It's, it's a significant amount of money that our customers are basically losing out on until we manage to get them up and running again. So keep that in mind when we talk about failure prediction and why we're doing what we're doing with Edge. Okay, so this is you know, basically what the pump is doing. Right, now, let's talk about some of the production challenges that we have and what we would need from an automation perspective in order to um, have some sort of success to reduce those challenges. So first of all, we have reservoir challenges, right? So we produce quite a lot of sand and scale. You can see over here. So in, coming into the reservoir, this is not clean fluid, right? There's, we have sand, we have gas, we have hydrogen sulfide, we have every sort of nasty type of thing. We have paraffins. We have every sort of nasty type of thing that you could possibly imagine that these pumps are having to, to withstand. What, and from a, what that does is it's going to destroy your pumps. And imagine a lot of sand going through your pumps. This is spinning at 3,600 RPM, and it's steel at the end of the day. Right? There's only so much um, wear your pumps can take before they fail. Now, what we want is we want some way that we can detect and be able to respond to those issues in an automated fashion. Right? Remember, I told you there's a sensor at the bottom, so we do have some data that we can interpret. But if we can interpret that in an automated fashion and then do something about it, we can extend the life of those pumps. Then we have wellbore challenges. So we have slugging that comes in. We have gas. Gas is a major problem for us. So if you have a large amount of gas that comes into a centrifugal pump, it will lock and it will stop producing. You really want to avoid shutdowns of your pumps. Okay? The, more, the more shutdowns we have, it means the more startups we have. And the most stress you place on a system is during the startup. So you do that too often, it's going to fail. So what we, what we want is, if it's possible to detect things like gas coming in early enough that you can then send the response, there are actually things we can do on surface because the way these things run, we use what we call vari the variable speed drive, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Now we can change the frequency and do some things in the algorithms to ride through a gas lock event if we know we have a gas lock event. Then we have operational challenges. Um, so we have you know, startup variances we deal with, we have ineffic inefficient operating conditions, we have production system anomalies, we have all sorts of problems operationally, again, that if the system is able to, to detect, we can potentially optimize on the fly. Okay. Now, the, again, it's all a question of being able to detect those things um, in order to know what to do. Now, today, traditionally, what we have um, in a, in a, in a real-time monitoring center, for example, you're going to have a bunch of engineers sitting behind screens trying to, trying to interpret all this information and work out what's going on and then try to, try to do some sort of remote response, some sort of remote control. Right? And we're, in, a, in a sense, what we're trying to do is to replace what those people are trying to do 
in an automated fashion, right? I mean, there's only so much work one human being can do. There's only so many events one human being can pick up. They don't work 24 hours a day. Um, if you can do that in an automated fashion, you really are you know, going to have a successful formula. Then intervention constraints. I just talked to you before about how much it costs to do the replacement of the ESP. Now, typically, typically today, when an ESP fails, that's when we know it's failed. And then we go and start working out the replacement. Now, it would make a hell of a lot more sense if we could do this, um, if we could predict that we knew we were going to have a failure in time, we could schedule way earlier. So if we knew that we only had three, four months left on the system's run life, we could start scheduling rigs early. We could even do preventative replacements, where you're really limiting that time it takes um, the deferred oil time that I talked about before. But the only way you can do that, again, is if you have some form of failure prediction. That's sort of the holy grail. You get the failure prediction working, man, you, you, you really do have a successful, a successful offering. OK, so when we looked at analytics, we looked at it in terms of three main sort of buckets of features that we're trying to achieve. One was around event detection. Um, to look at abnormal patterns of pump behavior that I talked to you about before. One is around failure prediction, so that we can do near real-time pump failure prediction. And the other one is around optimization, OK? Because we want to be able to ensure the maximum production by running the pump at the, the best efficiency we can and at the maximum speed we can to produce the most we can from the well. Now, we, as Al Khareif Petroleum, don't really have the capabilities in-house on our own. So we went out and looked for a partner to be able to do this with them. Um, and after we looked at a lot of different partners, to be honest, um, we found that you know, the, the, the company that had the offering that we felt was most mature um, and that we could work with was Schneider. Um, so what we did here, what you can see here on the screen, is really what we put in and what they're putting in to come up with what we think is you know, an offering that's really going to work for the ESP industry. So we, we have the artificial lift domain knowledge, our people in-house. We obviously have all of the, we manufacture all of the downhole technology, the stuff I showed you on the slide before. We have all the VSD technology. We build that. We have the sensor technology. We, we provide the satellite connectivity as well. We have the operational knowledge and the service capability. On the Schneider side, they have all the software and analytics that they're doing with us. So they have the event detection, the failure prediction, the analytics, all the cloud infrastructure, um, the controller we also, that we use for, um, for the variable speed drive with the RTU comes from, uh, comes from them, as well as the edge device. Okay? So it's kind of a, a marriage of two companies' capabilities together. And we think this should um, give us a, a recipe that works. So. I did a little worked example here to give you an idea of the sort of scale of savings that we could potentially have from these three different offerings that we're looking at. So I took an example of a well that produces 1,000 barrels of oil a day at $60 a barrel, which is actually lower than it is today. The daily rig rate I use is $100,000, which is reasonable. Um, and the replacement cost of an ESP is about $250,000. So if you look at event detection, if I can avoid an unnecessary, unnecessary failure due to an unwanted event, we would save 30 days of deferred production waiting on a rig. Right? So I'm going to save one replacement ESP and 10 days of rig time to replace the ESP. The total amount of savings is $3 million. Okay? Failure prediction, if I can plan the rig schedule based on, real, on near real-time predicted pump failure, I'd avoid about 30 days of deferred production waiting on a rig, which is about $2 million in this worked example. And if I can increase the production just by 10%, which isn't really a huge amount, if I can just increase the production by 10% and my pump runs for three years and I get 10% reduction in electricity consumption through um, improved efficiency, it's $6.6 .6 million of savings to my customers, right? So that's almost, if you add the three up, just on one well, on one well, we're almost at $12 million. Multiply that by the number of wells, et cetera, suddenly you start to see the scale of the types of savings that you make for your customers. Hence why this is really quite interesting. You know, the business case makes a lot of sense. 
OK, so when we looked at most of you have probably seen this slide before. This is a very old slide from, from Cisco from 2013. But when you look at it, and I th the model for IoT doesn't really change for what we need or from what anyone really needs. So we needed the, the physical devices and controllers. So that's the things in IoT. We needed the connectivity, the edge computing, um, and all the stuff that you see at the top here, the data accumulation, the abstraction, et cetera. So you, you need this all working together in order to have an offering. Hence why we had to do this with the collaborator. Right? We couldn't do all this on our own. So let me talk about the physical layer. So the physical layer, what we have out there today is we have the, the, the variable speed drive. The, the brain of the variable speed drive is here. So we have both um, the controller that we use, which is, um, which is this one that you can see up here. Now, the controller we use, we, we use a relatively generic controller that Schneider provides us, but we had to develop the software for the ESP industry. They didn't, they'd never done it on an ESP before, so collaboratively together, we developed all the software needed to actually run the ESP, right? Um, so that was done together, and that's, that's actually out there in the field now. I think we have a couple of hundred of these running. Um, and it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a very rugged designed controller. These things have to, like I said, you know, these things have to last in 55 degrees C, 98% humidity, stuck out somewhere in the middle of the sea somewhere. So they, they really do have to take a pretty severe beating. Um, the sensor itself that goes on the bottom of the equipment, um, the sensor itself will measure pressure from the intake of the pump and the discharge of the pump. So we get differential pressure across the pump. Um, it will measure the motor temperature, so that the temperature of the windings of the motor. It will measure the fluid temperature. Um, it will also measure the vibration. Okay, um, that's typically what those, that's typically the measurements we have today. Then, from a connectivity perspective, we use anything, so it doesn't really matter um, whether we're using a GSM network or we're using satellite connectivity or we're plugging into our customers' local area network. We can do anything. One of the main limitations we have, because we work in the oil field, a huge number of our customers have no GSM networks in the middle of the desert or the middle of the jungle in Colombia somewhere or the middle of, you know, I was out in the middle of the desert in Iraq a couple of years ago and they had 2G connectivity. It's not a lot you can do with that. Um, so obviously satellite connectivity becomes something that's quite important. Now what this means in terms of what we're doing with Schneider is we're having to come up with um, an offer. We have one offering that supports the high level of data trans transmission that we require on the GSM side. But on the satellite side, we've, we're having to come up with um, an offering that uses far less data. Because satellite connectivity is extremely expensive. You cannot send gigabytes of data across satellite networks without really paying a significant amount of money. And obviously, the preferred option, if you can plug into your, your customer's LAN network, you're, it's easy. OK, so this is sort of what it looks like all in all put together. So we have the, um, we have the, the, the RTU that we have also comes from Schneider. We use their SCADA pack, and we connect all of the, the, the physical, I don't know if this is working. Yeah, maybe there. OK, we connect all of the, the physical devices that we have. So whether it's the sensor information coming up, or whether it's surface um, pressure and temperature sensors that we have at the wellhead level, or um, you know, we have all sorts of different, or we have wellhead sensors, et cetera. That the more information we have, the easier it is to do the analytics. Um, we also, so you have the drive. Um, and you have the edge device sitting right here um, on site, OK? Now, the <coughs> edge is really important for us because of what I was mentioning. There's, there's, there's two issues we have. One is a connectivity problem, like I mentioned before. So you can't rely on just having stuff on the cloud. Um, the second thing is we, really, we almost split our analysis into what fast loop and slow loop. We have certain things that we really need fast loop response, say event detection, for example. You don't have time for the information to go to the cloud, to be processed up in the cloud, then to come back, and then to take action. By the time you've done that loop, especially if you have a connectivity problem, you could have failed the pump already. You literally have minutes. So it really does need the analysis to be done at the edge so that you can 
you can pick these things up as quickly as possible and, take, and the system takes the action as quickly as possible. There are certain things, say optimization, right? Production optimization is, is very data intensive, number one, and sort of lends itself more to being done at the slow loop, and you can do that in the cloud, no problem. That's really not an issue. It's not gonna, it's not gonna cause anything if I can't increase the frequency to produce more you know, for a few extra hours or for a few extra days, it really doesn't matter. But the fast loop stuff you really do need on the edge. So what we have, um, apologize for this. Yeah, okay, there it is. Okay, so what we have on the edge, we have a few different, we have a few different things happening on the edge. Um, we have all of the application and the device management stuff that we need. Um, that Schneider's obviously done a lot of work here to make sure this is all working. So these are all the, the Docker container orchestration, all the communication, the security. This all sits here. But then you have all the applications as well that you can put on. Now, it's a relatively open system. So it's not just the applications we're developing with Schneider that we can put on. If there are other third parties that have solutions, let's say, I don't know, let's say somebody has a really good virtual flow meter offering, we're able to put that on the edge as well. So it's, 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 it's quite an open platform to allow us to do that. Um, so if we go and develop our own algorithms, for example, with, you know, with somebody else, we can always put it on the edge device, no problem. Um, and then we have up in the cloud, we have the production advisor sits on the cloud um, where you can access it uh, through the web portal. And that's where you get the front end user interface with all the, you know, the event detection, what, what, what events have actually been detected and what the system's actually doing. Um, and, then, and then you have all the, you know, the connectivity of the control network and you know, your, your, your customer's enterprise if, if, if they have one. So um, we have sort of three different algorithms that are running. We have a threshold analysis, we have an unsupervised learning model, and we have a supervised learning model. Um, I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail on this. When you do the panel later, Vasilius can, can really explain this in much better detail than I can. Um, but basically, we have the threshold analysis today that sits on the edge, okay? This is an app that sits on the edge, and those thresholds are built from subject matter expert knowledge. So those are basically thresholds that we know that work, and we know what those events are, and so when an event occurs, the system will know exactly what that event is um, and, and pop up and tell you what that event is on the edge. We haven't yet done closed loop control. We're not yet, we're, that's gonna be the next phase that we do, where not only will it know what it is, it will also know what to do. So it's gonna send a feedback signal to the drive and tell it, you know, put it in gas lock mode, for example. Now we also have, on the cloud right now, which in the next three to four months, the unsupervised learning is expected to go on the, on the edge as well. So what the unsupervised learning does is, it does a cluster analysis and detects abnormal events. Okay, it's a statistical analysis and it will just detect an abnormal event without knowing what it is. It just knows there is something wrong, but without actually telling you what it is. Now what we do is we take the output from that unsupervised learning model, we, there's a supervised learning model where we do the classification. Okay, so I have application engineers who will then take the information from the unsupervised learning model and start to tag it, right? So we sit there tagging and saying, okay, this thing you picked up is actually gas lock this thing you picked up is actually sand, right? So we're starting to teach it. Now as we teach it and we gain confidence, we put it into the threshold analysis model on the edge, right? So now it's something that we've taught that's new and it goes on the threshold analysis and now on the edge it can also do it, okay? Um, okay, so that's, um, so let's summarize what I've said, okay? So, Hopefully you've understood that the business opportunity to digitalize in the oil and gas industry is really significant. I think I showed you the numbers. It's, there, there's a, it looks like a very, very interesting business model. Um, the partnership between the oil field services companies and the automation companies is really key to achieving success. They can't do it on their own. We can't do it on their own. Okay? This really has to be a marriage of two companies. Um, when we look at it for ESPs, the value is really in avoiding premature failures, increasing the production, and predicting failures, okay? Um, when we look at the enabling technologies today, what excites me is that the technologies exist today. The building blocks all exist. Edge exists, cloud exists. 5G connectivity is gonna be enormous once that's you know, out there in large enough 
you know, scope everywhere. Um, the sensor technology exists, both downhole and on surface. The advanced an analytics and the machine learning algorithms now, to a large extent, exist. And we have some very, you know, we have some really good controllers out there that we can use. We have some, you know, excellent um, graphical user interface for our customers, et cetera. So really, if you look at all the building blocks required to make this work, they're available. It's just a question of managing to put them all together and coming up with a, <clears throat> with a, with a successful formula. So that's me. Done. Thank you very much. <laughs>